It's a wonderful joy to have you with us again, if you're watching it. So welcome to each and every one of you that may ever watch this. And I hope that what I share is going to be very meaningful to you, which I pray about and I ask about. But I also want to say to you that what I share may not be what you've conventionally heard or the standard type of thing. But what I share is written and pasted in the scriptures. When I say pasted, it's for over 2,000 years, if it's Paul's writings, much longer than that in the Old Testament. But what I share with you is what the words of Scripture teach us. Now, that is something beautiful because it is the Scriptures that are our authority. I just want to run through a few things here. Forgiveness is a principle that requires justice, hence payment first. In God's eyes, forgiveness was possible because justice had been met. In other words, forgiveness was possible because Jesus Christ died for our sins, paid the price, and then he offers us forgiveness. And do you know that if Jesus Christ didn't die for our sins, we would be unable to be saved because God would still have to judge the sin in us instead of transferring it to Jesus and dealing with it. Now, I was recently chatting to somebody, very interesting, and I was saying, if your child is 16 years old, still at school, they take your motorbike or they take your car and they get a speeding fine, and should there be a roadside court? Do you know what's very interesting is that at that roadside court, if they caught him and they find him, let's say 500 rand, whatever it might be, and they then phoned you, they put him in handcuffs, they put him in the back of the, the, the police vehicle, and they phoned you to say your son has been arrested for speeding. Do you know what? You would drive out to the roadside court. But what happens is that we pay the fine. And do you know, once the justice has been met of the fine that is paid, if that were a roadside court and I went to my son and I paid the 500 rand because I love him, he's my son, and I take responsibility for him in some ways. Do you know that if they kept him in the van, handcuffed and locked in the back of the van, I could sue them because justice has been met, but they are still retaining him. That is not allowed. That's why when a man goes to prison and he serves his term and he gets out, they can't re or imprison him because justice has been met. He's done his time. What is so amazing here is that God paid the price through his son, Jesus Christ, who had not one sin of his own, but he died for us in our place. Like me paying the fine for my son, if I pay the 500 rand, I'm not paying my fine. I'm paying his. But the point that I make is justice was met for God's forgiveness to be able to be offered to us, and Christ paid the price. When God came into the Garden of Eden, he had Adam and Eve, but when he came to find them and they'd sinned, they ran away because they were ashamed of their nakedness. And what God did is he sacrificed a lamb and he gave them the lamb skins and the animal skins to cover themselves. In other words, even at the beginning, there was a sacrifice made for the sin of Adam and Eve. And that still remains because Christ was the sacrifice. That if you read the scriptures, it'll say there was only there were sacrifices every year until Christ died for you. And when that happened, do you know that there was no need for any more sacrifices because every shadow or every illustration of an animal dying had to do with the reflection of what would happen when Jesus Christ came. And when that happened, his death was reflected in, this, in the, the lamb's death because it was an innocent animal dying at the expense of the guilty person, the men and the women of Israel who offered the sacrifice as payment for their sins. Just to forgive makes no sense. And that's why Christ had to pay for our sins. Okay. Are you following me? God can't just forgive. Because what would he do with his nature of righteousness and justice if he didn't punish for the sin? He wouldn't be a very good God. Now you may say, yeah, but he could have and he would have and he didn't. No, 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 my friend. If you went to a magistrate and they were trying the person who had actually done your son's business in for his whole livelihood, and the magistrate said, no, nah, just forgive them, you wouldn't accept it. You'd say, no, he's got to try and make a plan to pay. And that's where the crime must match the time. And the crime was sin 
and the payment or the time if i can put it that way for the illustration is that christ's death paid the price isn't that amazing we have to know when a thing was written who it was written to why it was written and in summary if it's written to us it will come from the writings of the apostle paul who writes what god inspired him to write okay you with me on that i'm touching on some things that many of you know many of you understand many of you celebrate and i know you celebrate it because when you come to know the rightly dividing of scripture of what's written where what's written to who why it's written when you know that let me tell you it is beautiful because confusion dissipates because you don't take wrong instructions and that's why paul says a stumbling block to the jew foolishness to the greek because not philosophical enough enough but unto us who are saved now i've said this before and i'm saying it again if you read a wrong version which is any version about a king james bible it says those who are being saved and most people think oh well i'm in the process of being saved no it's an instant complete continuous work that when you trust christ holy spirit indwells you seals you saves you to heaven no matter what you do but when that takes place paul writes in first corinthians chapter one and what he says is that but we preach christ crucified stumbling block foolishness but unto us who are saved it is both the wisdom of god or the power of god and the wisdom of god and today you ask people how do you think god's power works and I say, yeah, but he's, he, you know, we were at the service and with the music and everything, the Holy Spirit was present. No, the Holy Spirit seals us. He's in us once and forever the day we trust Christ died for our sins. And he's not only the seal, but the Bible also says he is a, what we would call a deposit in our lives until the redemption and the purchased possession. In other words, till we go home to be with him. He's the security that we are God's because his spirit is in us. I hope you got that. But in Paul's doctrine, after the blood of Christ was shed and the price was paid, we have the greatest insight and understanding. It's so amazing. And he says, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities, sins are forgiven and whose sins are covered. He goes on in Ephesians 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Can you see anything there that says, if you... Uh, forgive the debts of one, then God will forgive your debts. No, it's unconditional forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. The point that I'm making here is that in the kingdom, when Jesus was on this earth, before he got crucified, even then, it was conditional. After his crucifixion, it was still conditional that if you receive him, this nation would become the nation through which the rest of the world would hear. And they never did that. And as a result, the grace through the Apostle Paul from God, the Holy Spirit, and Christ, our merciful Savior, it became God will forgive you anyway, without you even forgiving others. But when you know his forgiveness, you've got the resources to forgive out of compassion and the grace that has been shown to you. Look at Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. If your sins are not forgiven, you can't go to heaven. So we have found that redemption through his blood, which he shed on the cross, and we have found forgiveness of sins. People say to me, maybe God's punishing me for this. Do you know what my response is? If he punished you for anything, you'd be lucky if you were just a little pile of ash in the corner. Because if God punishes you, he's not just a guy bigger than you in the restaurant that you fall out with. Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, because they were Gentiles, only the Jews were circumcised. Paul writes, knowing that they were uncircumcised, they knew the Jews were circumcised, but he's bringing a new message, so he uses us as a run-in, and he says, have he quickened, which means to make alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, let me tell you, that principle is so beautiful that God's grace is his love shown to us. There's no condition except trusting him for this gift he gives us. 
and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost residing within us, and he changes our nature, our thinking, and our person, because he has forgiven us, and that is how we can forgive others. But should we not do so, it doesn't affect his forgiveness of us. But if it was the kingdom, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, first eight chapters of the book of Acts, if you did not forgive, you were not forgiven. Because you couldn't be part of a kingdom on earth to show his love if you wouldn't forgive others. It couldn't be a bunch of liars. Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. They gave their money, but they kept some back. Stone dead Ananias. A few hours later, stone dead Sapphira. How could he make a nation of people that the rest of the world was going to be converted through 2,000 years ago, and they're a bunch of liars? Dishonesty. The great key in life is not good or bad, right or wrong. It's truth or deception. And that's why this truth that Paul writes is what applies and what is written to us, but it's highlighted by the fact we look at what was written for us, but written to the Jews, and the difference puts us in the amazing grace of God. I hope what we've said makes sense. I certainly do more than you can ever imagine. And you know what? It's the understanding of the Word of God rightly divided and not confusing instructions. Because if you take the wrong instruction and apply it to your life, you won't be saved. This is not the way God's working. You take an animal and sacrifice it. God's not going to say, well, you know, Jesus died for your sins, but I know you mean well. No, he's going to say, you need to know the truth. And that is that you are saved because Christ paid the price of your sin. Do you know that sincere people often find the Christian message one that's difficult to believe because the Bible speaks of the fact that people will go to a lost eternity called hell. And they often ask, how can a loving God send people to hell? Well, how many people has God sent to this destination beyond earth? Millions, maybe billions? The truth is, not a single human soul was intended to be there by the loving God who offered grace. Consider the Bible's own explanation of where this place came from. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil and his angels sinned before the beginning of humanity in this world, and the everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. The only way for humanity to get to hell is to reject the gift of grace that is freely offered to every people and to every single person. Heaven is an option made available by simple faith in Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 6 declare this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have, in other words, whose will it is to have, all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God's grace certainly is amazing because all are offered the saving grace by trusting Christ Jesus died for our sins and rose again. So what are we saved from? Well, God's judgment of our sins and the torment of hell which we deserve as sinners because by rejecting Christ, we turn down the offer of heaven made freely available. There's no requirement on man's part other than faith and trust, so none need be lost. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. May you find the riches. And I promise you, if you've found God's riches for the last 20 years, but you've not seen this, there's a level of God's joy that you're still going to find. And boy, it is beautiful. Amen.